and I'll say a very good evening to everybody uh, who's joining us tonight. This is the Front Range Six Meter Group. Um, Bill uh, WT0DX and myself uh, started this thing back in April uh, last year, and we seem to have a lot of interesting uh, folks to come on here and talk. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, um, Hassan, N0AN, who I've always heard so much about and heard on the air, and Jim, W0, sorry, W7OUU in Idaho, who's uh, had a really, really good signal into here all the time. So without any further ado, I'm going to switch over and share the screen that kicks this thing off, and hopefully everyone else can see it. There we go. And uh, Hassan, would you like to uh, kick it off? Sure. Well, the first uh, the first thing I would like to uh, uh, greet everybody. I uh, I have never seen the the faces of almost any of you, and it's a real uh, a real kick to see uh, so many uh, uh, interesting faces. And uh, by the way, Bill, ND0B, I, I should tell you that Rich says that you need a haircut. Uh, now on to uh, more important things. Uh, this is not a theoretical presentation. Uh, it is not a technical presentation. It is a practical uh, presentation about uh, what is this mode? What does it do? How do you run it? And what are what are the pitfalls, uh, pluses and minuses, and things like that? So it won't be focused uh, on uh, a highly technical things. Uh, there are some pretty picky things to do with the software because of the state it's in. It's still a release candidate, but uh, this will get us up and going and, and get the most out of it. Uh, next slide, Paul. Uh, the reason this is titled Managing Expectations is because uh, some of the discussion that took place uh, on various uh, chat boards and uh, even on the WSJTX list, uh, things were getting completely out of control in terms of what people were uh, expecting. They come to a new mode and they bring with them the baggage of their previous modes. So uh, I'd like to start off talking about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, the, the uh, slow, uh, the fastest mode is Q6515A, and what that means is 15 seconds with uh, the A bandwidth. Uh, first, first of all, while it's got a nice, nice fast turnaround, it is not FT8. Uh, if you're in a hurry, Q65 modes are not really for you. Uh, if you're uh, looking for a, a ton of contact in a short time, just in the, in the, the uh, high goodbye approach of uh, FT8. Uh, Q65, that's not its purpose. Uh, when, when the uh, band conditions are quite good, where eSkip makes the ionosphere like a mirror, Q6515 will work, but not in a crowded band conditions. It doesn't do the same job that FT8 does uh, in terms of being able to separate signals that are one hertz apart and uh, overlapping signals and, and just in time can be uh, good. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Q6530A is 30 seconds long. Uh, again, it's not MSK144. If there are a lot of meteors, MSK144 is far faster to complete a QSL than Q65. On, now, on the other hand, on six meters, if there are a lot of rocks, FT8 is not a good mode as meteor scatter kills FT8 decodes. So th the point in looking at these various modes is uh, every mode has a purpose. They were designed, these modes were designed by K1JT to do specific jobs. Some of them got waylaid because they worked better uh, in uh, circumstances they did not anticipate. FT8 is a good example of that. It was not designed to be an HF mode. And look what happened. Uh, it turned out they performed really well and took over. You're not going to see that with Q65. Uh, there is not a single mode that exists already that doesn't do better at its individual job uh, than uh, Q65 does. But Q65 can do some things that none of the other modes can do. Uh, Let's see. Uh, 
Next slide. Q65 was designed uh, for scatter and specifically ionoscatter. It, it can make exceptional decodes on very, very weak signals using uh, a scatter off, off the ionosphere. Now, the interesting thing about Q65 is that it doesn't care what mode you're running. It will decode eSkip. It will decode, decode tropo scatter. It will decode Iano scatter, which it was designed for. It will decode EME. It will decode uh, ground wave. In other words, all these different propagation modes can be decoded by Q65. None of them wreck it like uh, some of the earlier JT65s, uh, where if you got a meteor burst, uh, the uh, decode would be wrong, and that's certainly true with FDA. Uh, this particular picture is kind of an, ex an example of uh, 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 scatter. And when you have two stations uh, looking toward each other, your signal is coming out in the form of a lobe or a, uh, a triangle, think of it that way, an inverted triangle. And where they intersect, there's a common scattering volume, a common scatter volume, and that's where you get the maximum uh, uh, reflection. That scattering can happen in the troposphere, where the limit in distance is only about 400 miles, or it can happen in the, on an ionospheric level, uh, where the distance can be 12, 13, maybe even 1,400 miles. You're, you're using the D and the E layer for uh, ionoscatter. The other thing is all these other modes tend to, tend to come and go. And by that, I mean, you have sporadic E openings, you have tropospheric ducting, you have uh, uh, meteor scatter. There's no meteors, doesn't work. Um, Iona scatter isn't like that. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it will, again, it will also take advantage of any propagation that's available. But where it really shines is what I call in the no waiting mode. If you're running ionoscatter, you don't have to wait for an open. Band's always open. The question is, do you have sufficient uh, uh, low noise level? Do you have sufficient power? And are you running the right mode to take advantage of it? So an important thing to consider with all of the Q65 modes is they don't need meteors or sporadic E to work. Next slide. Uh, Q6530A, which is the most common mode you will find on 50.275 on six meters, uh, is far more sensitive than MSK144 and the other digital modes. Uh, it, again, it does not require meteors for 24 seven, but it will take advantage of them if they're present. Now, when I say take advantage, they can help, but will Q6530A or any of the other modes Will, will they work better than MSK144 if there are meteors? No, they, no, it won't. If there's lots of meteors, the right mode is MSK144. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Q65 is not a plug and play mode. It's not like FT8 where you just turn it on and it all works. It requires some learning and some fine tuning to get peak performance out of it. Uh, Months of experimenting with early versions of Q65 have demonstrated the following. Without band enhancement, like sporadic E, meteor trails, or tropo ducting, it is not a typically uh, a random mode. In other words, you don't get on and call CQ. If you do that, you're, you're gonna find you get almost no answers. Now, right now there appears to be some extra in interest on 50.275 uh, with mode Q6530A-30A. Uh, there are people on almost every morning, and on weekends, they're on a lot longer. But it's certainly not like FT8, and it's certainly not like MSK144 in terms of operator density. Uh, the popularity of it is growing. People will come and get interested and then leave it, but it's not a, uh, it's not a CQ or random mode. Uh, when operator density increases dramatically, we probably will see uh, Q6530A will uh, catch on. And during E season, you might see uh, Q6515A, which is again, 15 seconds long. 
catch on, but it's not a replacement for FTA. If we have a good E opening, we're going to be on FTA. Uh, it's a different purpose. Uh, next. What can we expect for performance with 365? What does a station need to be? Uh, Well-equipped stations running 100 watts to Yagi's with low ambient noise can work consistently 1,000 miles at, any, at the best time of the day, 100 watts, best time of the day. With 700 watts or more, they can consistently work 1,000 miles any time of day. And that's using Q65-30A on 50.275. There's a reason I keep mentioning frequency. These modes are, cannot share the same band. Uh, we cannot have 120E and uh, 30A working on the same band because 120E is about five times as wide uh, and they just can't share, they can't be decoded anyway and they'll do nothing but QRM each other. So uh, we're for the present trying to choose frequencies, uh, watering holes where uh, Q65 30A, 30 second sequences uh, with sub mode A runs on a 50.275 in the space. Uh, Q65 120E, which is two minutes long with an E sub mode uh, is on 50.235. Those are just watering holes. Nothing's hard and fast, but if you want activity, that's where you'll have to look for it. Well-equipped stations running less than hundred watts to Yagi's with low local ambient noise can easily work 1100 miles using mode Q65 120E on six meters. That's 120 second uh, transmissions and sub mode E, which is very broad. It's about 500 uh, hertz wide. That mode is downright scary good. Uh, most hams don't have the patience uh, to wait for two minutes. Uh, most hams are in much more of a hurry. If you're a patient person, you will determine that 120E on six meters is magic. I have consistently worked people uh, from 700 to 1,170 miles consistently with almost 100% decodes. That is every sequence decoded at less than 25 watts on each end and oftentimes less than five watts. And I'm going to show you some, some uh, graphs of uh, contacts where, where uh, performance at, uh, at under five watts has been uh, in the 90% region without a band open. Uh, 120E is remarkable, but most people don't have the patience for it. Uh, next slide. Uh, I work at K1JT, the author of the program, uh, nearly every morning at 1,000 miles running 600 watts. And that's just not working in, but decoding 90% of available sequences. And what we do is we will turn auto sequencing off and just say, send the same sequence, like he'll send TX4 and I'll send TX5. We will do that for um, 30 minutes or 45 minutes and see how many sequences are sent versus how many sequences are decoded. And what we have found is we're getting about 90% of available sequences are decoded uh, running 600 watts uh, on six meters at a distance of 1,000 miles. Then Jim and I got crazy and decided to play around, W7OUU, and we worked day after day after day at a distance of uh, 1,070 miles, running less than 20 watts output on six meters, again, over a half hour, 45 minute period. Uh, and the decoding is absolutely astonishing. Uh, you'll see some of the results in the, uh, the stuff below. And this is not with stations that are uh, super stations. I'm running a five element LFA at 60 feet, fed with half inch hard line and uh, a lot of our early tests were run with, running with me running nothing but the internal preamp on my Kenwood TS590SG. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I picked up a used uh, ARR gas jet, and it's in the shack. Uh, and I put that on and turned the internal preamp off, and it's working even better. But still, I was having no trouble. Uh, what I have explained to people before who have come on uh, various chat boards and said, well, I, it doesn't work for me. 
this doesn't work. That, that if you're not able to get the results I've just presented, it's not the fault of the mode. It's something else that's wrong. Causes include, but are not limited to, and this is a big one, high local ambient noise. Many people I talk to and work have no idea how bad their local noise level is on six meters. They've never measured it. I consistently see certain stations from eight to 15 dB down on their receive side, who originally said, my noise is low. Measurements show just the opposite. Their noise is terrible and they just don't know it. Uh, not using the right power level or the right mode and mode settings for the path in question. Uh, this is an early stage of the release candidate one of Q65. There are some real strange idiosyncrasies about the, uh, about the software and its settings. And so uh, I'm gonna cover some of that here uh, that will get you going in the right direction. Once you understand how to use it, it works really well. Again, if you want plug and play, this mode is not it. Uh, next uh, setting, the slide rather. Setting realistic expectations for the Q65 suite of modes involves study, practice, and patience. Joe went to the trouble of producing a, a, a small PDF file that says understanding uh, Q65 decodes. Virtually no one reads it. Uh, he produced another one so called Getting Started in uh, Q65. Uh, very few people have read it. This is trying to take the place of it in a small way to get people going, but if you're interested in using the mode, it's a good idea to at least take a look at those, uh, those documents and they're on his Princeton uh, website. Uh, I just wanna emphasize that people come with a lot of baggage from prior modes. Q65 is not JT65, it is not QRA64, it is not FT8, and it is not MSK144. It is not point and shoot. It typically requires scheduling, and it always requires patience. Uh, here's some examples of Q65 uh, uh, graphs, as it were. This is a uh, the fast graph, the wide graph of K5GZR, who's at 870 miles. And we are running Q65-30A, that's the 32nd mode, uh, at 600 watts. And you can see it's just lighting up the uh, lighting up the, uh, the wide graph. Well, that's an exceptionally strong signal. And uh, uh, you could, if you looked at the actual decode, uh, the signal strength would be uh, uh, around minus 10. Here, and that's, uh, that was the, the mode uh, 30A. Now let's go to the next slide. This is mode 120E, very, very sensitive, but long two minute mode. And it's KB7IJ running 200 watts. And his signal level at this <laughs> decode is uh, minus 13. There is lasagna in your fridge if you want it. Uh, which is very loud. Uh, minus 13 is a very strong signal. And of course, we discovered later on that 200 watts at this distance was silly. Uh, when I can decode him at, at five watts. Uh, but that's how we learn. If you look at the bottom of that slide, uh, first of all, you see the speckles, uh, the distributed speckles from 1500 to uh, 2300 hertz. Uh, those are the different tones that are being uh, scattered back to us. And each of those contributes to a, uh, a decode. And down at the bottom, you will see an orange line with a peak and a red line underneath it with a peak. The red line is the sync of his signal. That is our, my sync to his decode, to his signal. The orange line is a called a multi-sync uh, and it would be showing for other stations in the band, uh, a past band, as well as my own or his own. So what that shows us is that one, he's very strong uh, and even and a very strong signal is producing a lot of speckles. And that's what we call them, sparkles or speckles. Okay, next slide. Here is um, 
again, uh, KB7IJ at uh, 670 miles, running the two minute mode, 120E, running all of five watts, and his signal to noise ratio on this is minus 19. And you can see the speckles uh, just uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's a few on the right-hand side of the bottle, bottom of the display of the graph. There's a few in the middle and there's a couple up top, but it's still producing a very strong red sync line. Uh, and the order, I'll cover the order of sensitivity of the display later that will explain how useful that red sync line can become. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is again five watts, 120E, two minute mode. And this is a minus 21 decode. And that's there again to illustrate the relatively uh, limited number of speckles. And yet look at that strong sync line. Well, it decoded beautifully at minus 21. How far can we go down and decode? Minus 27, minus 28, maybe even a little more with. Uh, message averaging, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later. So it gets to the point where you don't see anything on the screen, no visible indication that there's a signal even there. Uh, and yet you'll see a strong sync line and then a decode will follow. Now when signals get really weak, beyond crazy weak, you'll see a, a sync line, a red sync uh, line, but you won't get any decode and you'll see no sparkles. But just keep in mind, this is a different, this is not during a band opening. This is just pure scatter. And we're running five watts and going 670 miles uh, with uh, decodes at 100%. So this goes on for five or 10 minutes. I would have uh, uh, five to 10 decodes and never even skip one. It's ridiculous. Uh, next slide. Again, KB7IJ, two minute mode, five watts, and there's a decode at minus 24 SNR. And, and you can see there's very little that you can discern there, maybe a few uh, sparkles at the beginning, just below the, and to the right of the sink line, uh, nothing that you would uh, hang your hat on. Yet look at the uh, red sink line, very strong sink. And it decoded quite easily at minus 24. Uh, just as a casual mention, you see the letters M, R, and 73. The 120E mode and some of the other longer modes uh, have a way to send just fixed tones like the old, uh, uh, J, was it JT65? Anyway, whatever was being used for EME uh, sent single tones for uh, various parts of the QSO. This can do that too if you turn SH on, but quite frankly, there's no real need for it for the kind of work we're doing. But that's what those, uh, the M, the R, and the 73, there's a T, an M, an R, and a 73. That's what those are for SH mode. And I think if uh, uh, Lance is here, W7GJ, he can explain that far better because I don't work EME. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is again, uh, uh, the, the two minute mode running four watts. And what I really wanted to put up this up here for is, uh, first of all, there's some interference, just some, some noise that you can see in the system with those vertical red traces, uh, red uh, spots up in, the, the, uh, in the, the graphic display. But what's important about this particular one is notice it says minus 26 average Q33, and what that means is, is that during this particular uh, sequence, uh, I got a decode that was not a direct decode. <coughs> Excuse me. It was the result of averaging three different messages, which this software does brilliantly. Uh, no matter what mode you run, it is capable of message averaging, and I'll be discussing that a little bit later. So what this did was, it missed three messages in a row. It skipped them. And then all of a sudden, the very next message came up with a, a Q33. And that says, Q3 means I'm getting a, uh, a grid and a call sign using AP decoding. And the second three says, I have taken the last three 
uh, sequences that did not decode, put them together and got a decode. And so that adds another approximate 3 dB of sensitivity uh, when, in, when uh, message averaging is invoked. And that happens automatically. You can't make it happen. It, the program decides when it can do an average. And if the signals are strong, it won't average at all. You'll never see it. And that you might think that averaging isn't even working. It's always working. It just isn't used if the signals are strong. And the AP decoding is so good that averaging takes place probably less than 5% of the time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of 100 watts uh, with WB4HIE, James out in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we call that QRP when we're on, on the, uh, the 60A mode. Um, or actually, I think this was 30A. I think I've mislabeled this. But um, this is a 100 watt signal with the band up a little bit. It's not like that. You, there's no meteors involved, but there's a little band enhancement going on now because 100 watts at that distance uh, will not always produce the very bright sparkles you're seeing. But what's good about this display, it is a classic ionoscatter display. You see scattered, random sparkles. You don't see big, bright blobs. Big, bright blobs are meteor pings. There aren't any on this. And this is uh, 60A, and you can tell because it's only uh, from 1500 to 700, a 1700 hertz line, as opposed to the E mode, which is 1500 to 2300, much, much wider. And again, if you look down at the graph, you will see the very strong red sync line. Uh, next slide. This is a, uh, this is, this one's quite interesting. This is the uh, a QSO that I had with KB7IJ, where you can see the layout of the WSJTX screen. Uh, and it shows the single period decodes on the left and any average decodes on the right. And you, you can look at this and see the QSO started uh, at the very top, uh, maybe a bit hard to see, but at the very top uh, is the initial call. And then uh, he is transmitting to me and it says Q3. And what that means is uh, a priori AP decoding is taking place or has taken place. Uh, and I got the call on the grid. And, so, and so each time there's a decode, you'll see that Q3 over and over again because uh, it's getting the call in grid. If you look over on the right, however, at 1338 at the top one, which is about five uh, sequences in, if you look at the left side at 1337, it did a skip, it didn't decode anything. But at 1338, it took that skip. Anytime it skips, it's still compiling data for the income or for the message average. Now, I wanna say that again, because it's a little strange. Even though a decode is skipped, not everything is lost. Part of it gets stored to be later used for income averaging. And if it gets enough samples, it will be able to create a properly decoded message. And that's exactly what happened over at the top at 1338 on the right-hand side. It says 1338.00 minus 20. And then at the very right edge, it says Q32. What does that mean? Q3 means I used AP decoding to get the call in the grid. And the two that follows says I used two messages to completely decode the message. I averaged two sequences. The next one down below that, 1344.00, if you look to the right, it says Q33, which means I used three sequences to create a decode. Well, if you look at, uh, if you look on the left-hand side at 1342, 43, and 45, see those three empty spaces? Those are skipped decodes. But during those spaces, it was compiling data to be used in message averaging. And those three blank 
skips resulted in this decode that says 1344 Q33. I used those three blank spaces. They had valid data in it, but not enough to decode until we put them together. And once they did the averaging, bingo, we got a decode. Uh, so each time you see a blank, don't assume, oh, I missed some. You missed a decode, but later it may result in a decode through message averaging, which is really a cool feature. Okay, uh, next, uh, next uh, slide. Okay. This is an example of uh, 120E, again, the two minute mode with uh, KB7IJ running all of three watts. And this is at a distance of 670 miles. And if you look at it, you will see, let's see, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven total sparks. That's it in two minutes, seven total sparks. What did I get out of it? Absolutely perfect decode uh, at minus 20. It's uh, truly remarkable. Uh, next slide, please. This is another example of uh, a minus 24 signal to noise ratio decode. Uh, very little visual information available, but a strong sync line. The red line is very strong on a peak. And yet the waterfall is nearly invisible in terms of any meaningful uh, data. And with any of these, you can't hear a thing if you're listening to the audio. And yet at a signal level of minus 24, it was a perfect decode. Uh, notice the red sync line showing that sync has been detected. Uh, next slide, please. And now we're going on to uh, basic settings, how to set this thing up so it will actually do what you want it to do. Uh, and some of it's counterintuitive, so stick with me here. Uh, if you want to just generally monitor 50.275 for uh, activity, which is where the majority of the activity will be at this point in uh, the software's development. We're going to use mode Q65-30A. That's a 30 second uh, uh, TR and sub mode A. We're going to set decode to fast. That is decode deep is not used. It doesn't do a thing for us and it only slows things down. That's the current state of the software. So. While it seems like decode should work better than decode fast, it doesn't. So set decode to fast. Enable averaging for general monitoring should be turned off. That is, that's an anomaly of the software. It shouldn't work that way, but it does. KB7IJ discovered this and we reported it to uh, uh, K1JT and he has verified that uh, in release candidate one, if you're just going to monitor the band, you will get a greater number of decodes by turning enable averaging off. Underneath that uh, decode menu, it says auto clear averaging. That should always be on whether you're using uh, whether you're using averaging or not. And then FTOL, you can set it to anything you like, but it's usually less than 50 hertz. I use 20 hertz. It has no effect while monitoring no effect while monitoring at all. But in a QSO, it has a big effect and I'll be discussing that in a little bit. So just to review for 50.275, you run Q6530A, don't run another mode in there. Decode is fast, enable averaging is off. Auto averaging is always on so you don't have to play with it. And F call you can set anywhere you want, but it's better if you set it lower. Uh, next slide. If you're in a QSO, number one, if you're going to, uh, as soon as you call someone, it fills in the DX call and grid. If you're going to schedule someone, before you even start to schedule, put in their DX call and their grid and hit uh, generate message. Uh, the reason you do that is it'll start uh, a priori decoding immediately. So it'll pick up decodes faster in the beginning. So. 
we're going to start with for inside a QSO, you want enable averaging on. They'll pick up two to three dB of sensitivity. The cost for that is you won't monitor as many signals with uh, enable averaging on, but it'll do better with the signal you're trying to work with. So in QSO, enable averaging on. Make sure your receiver is dead on the station you're trying to work. You can transmit anywhere you like, but the guy you're working has to be listening where you're listening, where you're transmitting. So make sure you're on each other's frequency because when you narrow up your FTOL, you will miss decodes if you're not on frequency. Uh, and this is a comment from uh, Joe K1JT. No mode is immune to QRM. With overlapping signals, Q65 will usually decode the one at slightly lower frequency first. You can often decode the one at a higher frequency by double clicking on it with FTOL small enough to exclude the lower one. So that's a little complicated, but what it really is, is, is saying is there can be some overlap. And if you wanna look at the overlapping signal that did not decode, uh, if you put your cursor over the uh, left edge of the, we'll call it the offending signal, and double click there, it'll decode. And uh, if it's decodable, it will show up. So running split works fine. You don't have to call people on their frequency. It's not necessary. Just make sure that your receiver is on the other guy's transmitter and his uh, transmitter is on your receiver. And also remember when in QSO, uh, enable averaging to pick up the extra sensitivity. But if you're just looking for signals, monitor turn enable averaging off. This will be fixed in release candidate two, but in RC1 it's necessary. Uh, next slide. When hunting for a particular station, pre-fill the DX call and grid, grid info. Pre-fill it. That'll cause AP decoding to take place. Be sure to hit F4 to clear this info when going back to general monitoring. So if you're just gonna You've just finished a QSO, you've had a great time, uh, and you're done. Hit F4 to clear that information out. Uh, what does FTOL do? Uh, it doesn't work the same way as it did in FT8 or MSK144. Uh, if set to narrow, as it should be, it prevents syncing on false Wi-Fi and LAN birdies, which will cause legitimate signals to fail to decode. So setting FTOL narrow helps. It also ensures that a signal close to the frequency will be the first one decoded. Um, a way to describe how this software performs in general. Uh, from the lowest probability of the decode to the highest. If what you get is no sync line, you don't see a red sync line, or you don't see even a, an orange sync line. Again, the orange is a, uh, the red is if you're have a call entered, if you, uh, so that's important. Uh, the orange is if you don't, it'll do both. But... So no sync line and no decode, that's as bad as it gets. So if you're trying to find someone, you've got their call entered and their grid entered, and you're not seeing a red sync line, and you're not getting a decode, either they aren't transmitting where you think they are, or propagation is just impossible. The next lowest level is you get a red sync line, but no decode. What that's telling you is that I've got enough information to detect that that, that guy is a guy they're calling, but it's not good enough to decode. It's close. And so that's what it's used for. If you get a red sync line, it's identifying a signal. It just can't decode it yet. That's a good sign. It's certainly better than the previous where you didn't get a sync line. Uh, thirdly, you get a decode with the call and a grid entered. And then fourthly, you get a call, you get a decode with the call and grid and enabling average. So the, the, the most sensitive that you can get is decode with call and grid and enable average. That's as good as it can get. Um, Keep in mind, enabling averaging will decrease the number of decodes when just monitoring. It's very easy to, to get out of a QSO and forget and you leave enable averaging 
on. That doesn't prevent the other in passband signals from decoding, but it's not as sensitive, so you'll miss some. And like I said, that's supposed to be fixed in uh, RC2. Okay, uh, next please. This is uh, an example of uh, how crazy 120E can be in terms of sensitivity. This is a QRP test I did with KB7IJ. And uh, we were running uh, no more than five watts and going lower. So we started out with about five watts. And by the time we get to the bottom, uh, we're running uh, one watt or less. And this is at a distance of 670 miles on six meters, no enhanced band conditions. Um, and you will see that in the beginning, the signal is minus 24 at 1404. We showed minus 24. At 1408, we showed minus 19. And notice the decode, it says Q3. That means I used a priori advanced uh, decoding. And I got message number three, which is the full answer three. So those were strong enough that we did not get uh, any averaging. So there was straight copy. Uh, 1404, 1408, 1412, minus 24, minus 19, minus 21. Then notice at uh, 1416 and 1420, we didn't get any decode. It skipped. Then we went to, um, then if we look down at the bottom here, so we skipped at 16 and 20. It's like, oh, geez, I lost the day. I didn't get any data. Wrong. We did get data. Because look at the very bottom of the screen where I copied uh, uh, what happened on the right side of the screen. At 1424, we got a Q33. And so what it did is it took the, the skip from 1416 and the skip from 1420 and the signal from the present at 1424 and took those three sequences, did a message averaging and got a minus 26 decode uh, at uh, a very low power level. So we saw one average that happened as a result of two skipped sequences and then the third sequence is where the average was printed. So when we look at this again, Q33 means three messages were averaged to get this low minus 26 SNR decode uh, Q3 by itself means a priori or AP decoding was available and used. Uh, two digits means message averaging and the AP decoding. Um, enable averaging will decrease the number of decodes when just monitoring. I know I keep harping at that, but I can tell you the, num the number of times during uh, a two or three hour period of messing around that I found myself forgetting to turn off enable averaging when I was just monitoring the band uh, was scary. So it's either me alone or everybody's gonna have this problem. Uh, next slide. This uh, is a, a QRP test run by KB7IJ and I running 120E, low, uh, wide band, uh, two minute long testing on 50.235. Again, the distance is, uh, 670 miles. And what I did here is I went back and we were running sliding power tests. And uh, you can see what happened. The initial, and while it's saying 73, it's saying that because we decided to fix our, our TXs so we could run uh, minute after minute after minute without that having to hit auto sequence. So, and that's the recommended process for testing that uh, K1JT uh, Joe put out. So at 12.48, we have a minus 18 decode at 10 watts with no averaging, just uh, AP. At 12.52, we have the decode, uh, again, uh, minus 17, 10 watts. At 12.56, we got a minus 17 at five watts. Now, okay, you could say, well, how come that happened? Well, the band goes up and down. The number of reflections off the discontinuities in the uh, in the, the uh, E layer in the ionosphere, and those things are constantly in a state of flux. So it's not a band opening; it's just the availability of little uh, discontinuities. 
So five watts, and we're still at minus 17. Keep in mind our threshold is minus 27 or worse. At 1304 to 1308, Rich and I decided that we were going to stop and quickly run over and have a contact on the XW2F satellite on single sideband, which we did. So while it showed up as a skip, it wasn't a true skip because there was no data coming either. At 1312, we resumed at five watts and it was minus 22. So the band had gone down a little bit. Uh, at 13, uh, 1312, at 1316, uh, we went to three watts and we were still at minus 24. 1320, three watts, minus 26. 1324, also three watts, minus 22. 1328, two watts, minus 24. 1332, uh, minus 21 at two watts. Then we had two sequences in a row uh, one at two watts and two at one watt, where we got no, no decode whatsoever and no average. So the signal was so low during those three sequences. And that's why I say the SNR is not always a true measure. There just wasn't anything there to decode. And we didn't get an average either. So there are, there are circumstances where there's no guarantee that every time you get a no decode, that it's going to contribute to average. It will a lot, but not always. But then out of the blue at the very end, the band came up a little bit. There were more discontinuities to work with. There were, and I can tell you from looking at the waterfall, there was no meteor thing, it was straight scatter. All of a sudden we got a decode at minus 28 with one watt, uh, 670 miles. 670 miles, one watt on six meters. But again, we're having to wait for two minutes on each transmission. So this is not for the impatient instant gratification crew. Uh, next slide, please. This is the shack of KB7IJ. And uh, while this contact was going on, if you will look at his array solutions power meter on the left-hand side, that's 1,100 milliwatts. That's what we were running when we did that test. Uh, his shack's a lot neater than mine. Okay, uh, next slide. This is uh, from W7GJ uh, and uh, is, uh, is Lance here so he can make some comments on this? If you're Lance, please. I am here. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Lance, go ahead and make some comments about the EMA side because you are far more knowledgeable about it than I am. Okay. Well, as Hassan has said, has mentioned, I also have been testing out um, Q65 over the last few months, and um, I've been testing it on EME, and. Uh, the development team hopes that Q65 will now replace JT65, uh, which has been the EME mode. Uh, and at this point, I, you know, there are a lot of things that haven't been fully developed in this uh, release candidate uh, version of 2.4 which is out now, but um, we've, we've still been playing around with it on EME and uh, Joe feels pretty comfortable that, or confident that it is in fact as sensitive as JT65. Um, what I don't know yet is whether or not it will work in pileups as well as JT65. Uh, when I go on EME D expeditions on six meters because you can't see the signals as well. Um, however, here's an example. I was on uh, two meters tonight uh, before the Zoom conferences that I had. And uh, well, let's see, I don't, you can't see my screen, can you? So anyway, you can see at the bottom of the waterfall, you can see the little 
red blip, which is the, the uh, signal at the top of the screen, uh, the top of the waterfall that I'm working right now. And you can see, I have everything slowed down uh, dramatically. This, this is uh, the 60, uh, the 60 second mo period uh, sequence mode, uh, Q65-60A. And um, I slow the waterfall down uh, over here uh, at the bottom of the waterfall where it says N average 20. You can barely see that. I don't know if you can, you may have to blow that up on your screen to, to see the details, but uh, that gives you a lot more definition in the in the actual uh, signal uh, that's being sent, and so that's why in the top of the screen, there at uh, something like sixteen hundred and fifty hertz or something, you can see you can see a range of signals across there, and you can see the sync tr trace itself where the red spike is. And you can only do that because I have everything slowed down so much so that I can visually see it in the most sensitive mode uh, because obviously I'm working EME, which is uh, everything is has to be very, very sensitive. Um, you can see over here, you, here you can see, uh, I don't know if you could blow it up or not, but um, <laughs> I don't seem to be able to blow it up on my screen when I, when I look at it, but um, anyway, there are like several stations that I completed with there that are shown and, and it has averaged a few of them. The average thing doesn't really work very well right now because um, if people are sending reports and they change over the, over the course of a contact, then the average is just thrown out. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't average properly. So you can't, uh, right now it's recommended for the weak signals that you, that uh, on EME anyway, that you don't use the average because, because of that, unless you know that they're sending, only, you're only expecting Rogers or 73s or something that will be the same each sequence. Um, but anyway, so does anybody have any questions about about its use on EME? I've got some schedules, come, one coming up tonight with a new country on uh, two meters and then the, tomorrow night, a new one on six meters. And I'm gonna be using Q65-120A, which gives me three more extra dB. Um, so if JT65A is roughly equivalent, at least according to Joe, maybe even a Q65-60A is a, a, maybe a little bit better than JT65A, then I should be able to get a solid 3 dB by doubling the, the length and going to the two minute sequences. So that's what I'm gonna be doing on uh, tonight and on six meters tomorrow night to uh, try for these new low power uh, contacts with, with, uh, with new countries. Lance, um, Lance, yes. Lance do, do you uh, normally uh, use Ping Jockey EME1? Is that where people might look to see when you're gonna be on? On two meters, they use that. On six meters, uh, the real-time coordinating is done on the ON4KST EME chat page. Okay, so thank, thank you. Tonight I was on two meters and I just wanted to let people know I was on 107 calling CQ and um, every once in a while I'd announce that on the chat page and I, and I got calls from I don't know, I one, two, three, four, five stations that I worked in the hour before my Zoom meeting. In fact, one of them is on here tonight. W5EME is on here tonight. Thank you for the contact. I think it was his first Q65 contact. So um, it is because there were a number of stations on Q65 on two meters. So uh, despite the fact that the program really isn't, <laughs> it isn't gelled yet, uh, but it's coming right along and they're taking a lot of feedback and, uh, 
and wave files and and fine tuning the uh, features so that it'll be a little bit easier than on the release candidate two, the next version that comes out. And um, and I'm putting together a a quick a quick start or how to how to get set up on Q65 for EME. Uh, page just like I did for JT65, but I'm holding off a little bit on that because everything is in flux so much. So many of these little features don't work quite right. There's a shorthand message on here that doesn't really apply for VHF EME. It's only used for sending um, sending messages on microwave, and they don't count anyway for for signal reports. So. Um, there are little little things like that that are going to be changing, I'm sure, in the next uh, version. Okay, uh, uh, let's see, um, uh, Lance. I've got one other thing I want to cover here in the uh, before we go to Q and A. Uh, one other thing I want to cover about the the, the feature in the software, and then a couple of other uh, what I call uh, uh, nits and bits, and then we can go to uh, uh, Q and A from everybody. Um, Paul, if you could put uh, the uh, QSO with averaging uh, graphic up that shows all of the uh, uh, exchanges with uh, KB7IJ and I, where we had the signal levels, uh, and it shows the whole screen. I'm just trying to figure out which one that was. Uh, I'm just looking. Oh, it's, at back, it's back about five, <laughs> uh, five or so. Five or Let's so, see. So. I'll, I'll count for you. Hang on. <laughs> okay. If we use uh, if we use W seven GJ's page as the start, yeah. uh, go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about nine up, and you should see the page that says QSO with averaging, and it's got the uh, KB seven IJ on the left side with orange and. Uh, on the right side, the blue and orange, and it's a standard uh, WSJTX screen. Okay, I uh, got it, I think. Let's see if I can get there from here. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's see. Is that it? That's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, if you will, the last uh, feature I wanted to point out uh, is if you look at the uh, bottom, very bottom of the screen, uh, on the left-hand side, it says receiving, and then Q6530A Bodner, uh, last TX. Uh, and then there's two little numbers. It's a window. It's actually, it's a dual window. There's a one and a four. The way that we couldn't figure out what that was about until uh, Rich and I played with it for about a, an hour. Uh, and what that is, is if you're in a QSO, if you're in a QSO, one of those two numbers, either the left one, the one, or the four, depending upon which sequence you're transmitting, first or second, will increment every time it skips a decode. So if you have uh, a decode skip, uh, it starts out at zero and zero. And if you have a decode skip, it'll say one and zero. Another decode skip, it'll say two and zero. Another decode skip, it'll say three and zero. And then on the fourth, fourth uh, sequence, if it does a decode, it'll reset to zero, zero. So if it does a decode on the left side with no averaging or the right side with averaging, it'll reset uh, it to zero, zero. Now what that is really telling you is how many frames were skipped before I got a decode. So that's all that does. And uh, it's, it's not that important, except I saw earlier today while running with uh, Rich, I got a decode of Q38, Q38. And what that means is, is it took the previous seven sequences plus the current sequence. It took all of those to create one decode. And so it was reading eight. And the, after that average decode, it reset it to zero. So that's what those numbers mean down. Uh, only one of the two numbers means anything uh, to you while you're running, because you'll either be the left number that's incrementing on skips, 
or the right number, depending upon whether you're transmitting first or transmitting second. Uh, th that's the, the meaning of those two. The uh, other uh, thing I wanted to cover, um, let's see here. Bring that up and not mess it up. All right. Uh, I talked about the two little windows. Those are the skip sequence counter. Uh, a, a skip decode does not mean that nothing was accomplished. It could be building data that will be used subsequently for message averaging. Uh, as Lance said, this is a work in progress. Some things don't work right. Auto sequence doesn't always start properly. Frequencies are watering holes at the moment. They're set up for testing in the USA. Feel free to do your own thing when scheduling. Do not run uh, Q6530A and Q65120E on the same frequency. They are not compatible. Uh, 275 is for 30A, 235 is for 120E in the USA. The idea is not to share the same passband as the, uh, they aren't co uh, compatible. Uh, with this software, crashes are not uncommon. They will happen. Be sure after you've had a crash to look for orphaned JT9 processes with the task manager. It'll crash and yet there'll be a process running called JT9. If you try to restart the software at that point, you'll get an error. When you get that error, go into task manager and look for JT9 da 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 da, -da as a process. Find it terminate it, and then it will run just fine. Uh, SNR reports are not perfect. They're not reliable, but they are useful. They're being fine-tuned. And then we had the comments by Lance. So at this point, that's about all that uh, uh, we can provide. I would like to turn it over to uh, uh, GMW7OUU for any comments he might have, and then we can start taking any questions that might be had. Yeah. So I'm going to do a demo too here, Hassan. We're going to. Oh, that's uh, right. I forgot about that. Go ahead. So yeah, let me just show you the demo, and then this is this is may or may not be the right way to do things, but we're going to try anyway. <laughs> Absolutely, go for it. All right, I guess go down to the bottom here. Okay, so let me um, make a couple of switches here. I'm going to move uh, something over into the shared screen. See if you can see that. Ta -da. And if I can make it bigger, it will be better. Hmm. Well, I mean, let me try it on a different screen here and I can just change it around once I can figure out how to do stuff. There we go. All right. I'm going to change the share here for a second. And it should be the screen right here. How's that? Can everyone see it? You bet. Yeah, that's All right. better. Okay. Good. All right. So uh, Bill is at the other end. I'm uh, I'm going to go second on this thing, and uh, he's going to transmit and see if I can decode him here. Um, I by the way, my antenna's out east <laughs> towards the east, and I see a signal. Oh, he's really strong. God, I thought you're I thought you're running QRP, Bill. A uh, couple watts. Uh, well, cool. There he goes. That, so there's there's a decode on him. He's uh, plus one. And uh, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to be basically, let's see if I can get him on here. I think you're fine. Just wait for transmit. Yeah, I think you're right. We're, by the way, we're just on 15 seconds here just for time. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Now what's uh, What are these artifacts out on the right-hand side over there? Are those reflections off the mountains around you? Or? Uh, yeah, well, those are probably off the buildings downtown. I'm, okay. I'm running, as you can see my output power here, it says zero. <laughs> I've, I've got it tied right down low. It's magic. <laughs> yeah, I got my, I, I turned it off, turned off my output power. So it's, it's whatever. Yeah, wait, wait a minute. You're plus nine and I'm plus one. You're clearly running a lot more power. Yeah, I've, I've got nothing in my antennas pointing into the, into the downtown area, about nine degrees to what you are. So 
You should background, you background noise level will change the SNR. That's true. I got a lot of noise downtown right now with the snow falling on the power lines. Oh. <laughs> and there we go. It worked them. All right, now it's going to say, I don't understand Q65. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to move up on Squaw Mountain. That's all there is. Squaw Mountain, yeah. Hey, hey, Paul, just yes, for sir. the fun of it, um, since that worked and that was fine, why don't we just go to the 32nd? Uh, I mean, it, we don't need to, but let's change the TR to 32nd and do it again. Okay, we can go, I'm going to move it up to 30 seconds. Here we go. And, and, and notice that the red line uh, got a lot shorter at the top. Yes. The, the width of the signal is, is narrower, or the area covered. That's good to know. All right, here you can see his stuff from the, coming up there. You got some signal coming in here. Yeah, sir. He's still strong, Bill, and I tried to diminish you as much as I could. Do I need to hit uh, enable TX or not yet? No. It's a long, long decode. Yeah, click, click on my call. Click on it when it, yeah, click on that. Let's see if it gets me in there. Yeah, it got it in time. Yeah. If you like to watch paint dry, this is great. Uh, by the way, Paul, you're like S5 here right now. Uh, no, I can't do much else. Like I said, I got no power coming out of this amplifier. My amplifier is off, actually. It's just going through there. Let me try that. Why is it showing FT8 and Q65 on the bottom of WSKT? Here, I dropped my power some more. I actually found a way to do Well, it's, it's because <laughs> Paul's on the... I think he's on his FT8 configuration, but he changed the mode to Q65. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about that. It's just it's just my it's the configuration I had up early. I don't have a configuration for Q65 yet. Here, I just dropped my power down some more. You should have some trouble hearing me now, Bill. Tim. <clears throat> yeah, well, very strong on the waterfall, but you're not moving the S meter anymore. Good. All right, try to keep that SV not moving. <laughs> Just pretend this is coming off the moon. While we're waiting, did you notice that uh, Hassan had his in dark mode? Yes, I do. He's a dark guy. <laughs> yeah, very. A lot easier on the eyes to run dark mode for me. Did you get a decode on me at all, Bill? Oh, yeah. Oh, even though I'm running no watts, <laughs> it says zero. So it's the best I can do. Minus one is a report. So yeah, I just, I just actually finally turned my antenna completely away from you. So that, that reduces the signal strength, of course, but yeah. it's still you know, beautiful, beautiful on the waterfall. Yeah, well, this is just for demonstration purposes, so you kind of see what's going on. You can see the difference in colors and everything else that's there. Yeah, one thing to note is that waterfall you're seeing on the uh, WSJTX fast graph, that is uh, horrendously strong signals. What you should be seeing uh, with uh, ionoscatter will be uh, sparkles of uh, white and dimmer than white uh, is more typical like graphs, graphs I was showing. This, uh, this particular uh, display you're showing here is outrageously strong. And something to keep in mind, uh, uh, we have noticed that some really loud signals like 20 over nine uh, won't even decode because they're too strong. Hmm. Well, as I can put my amplifier away. <laughs> All right, good guys. I think this is this is a good demonstration. Any questions on what I just did? I guess you got it all. All righty. Let me um, switch uh, switch over to the Q and A.
And move back over here. Bum, 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 bum. I guess I can stop this here. Yeah, by the way, Paul, I, I have my power turned all the way down on the radio right now, and I'm pointing away from you. Uh, I see I see you on the on the waterfall. Yeah. It, yeah. That, uh, is, that's where it should look like. <laughs> let's let's just let it decode and see if there it is. You decode it. I didn't answer you, but. That's my 7,600 power set all the way to minimum. And my antenna is pointed, you know, totally in the opposite direction to Paul at this point. Yes, and that's a more classical display of what uh, the mode should look like. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, ne next time we do a demo, we'll start here. Yeah, I can see your. CQing again. And I have a lot of noise here too, so that's. that's well, something. see, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing you can do with Q65 like this, is you can set your power levels the same and point at each other uh, and then observe the difference in SNR. And if, if I'm reporting a much better SNR than you are, that means one thing, your ambient noise is higher than mine. Yeah, I'm just gonna try to answer them here and see if it. Uh, but yeah, you're right. The so the the red line is the. I'm, I was trying to look for the uh, sync line. I guess uh, where would I where would I get that? You, you got to turn that on. If you go to the bottom of the waterfall screen, um, there is a setting where it says cumulative. Click there, and change it to Q65 sync. There you go. Now it'll do it. See, I didn't know that. You just I just learned something else. That's why I get the big bucks. Exactly. <laughs> uh, how do you how do you bring that up again, Hassan? Okay, just at the bottom of the waterfall, there's a section that says uh, uh, cumulative. It's a drop down menu. If you click there for Q65, you should select uh, Q65 sync. I have a different configuration for every mode for this purpose, so I don't have to change settings. So I have the configuration for FT8 a configuration for MSK144, a configuration for WSPR, a configuration for Q65. That's why they put that configuration menu in there is so we could get set for maximum performance and not have to change settings. Because what I found is we constantly forget where our settings are. Yeah, well there, well, there you go. And there's the red line. Yep, there's an orange line and a red line. The orange line is the wideband sync called multi-sync. And the uh, red line is the sync on the station you're working. Well, there you go. Real time demo. And, and uh, I learned somewhere, and this is Q2 beside, beside his, uh, his decode there. So. Sending you the uh, RRR right now, I think. Yeah, I see it. I, I just got it there, and there's the Q3, it says. Yep. Because that means it got, it got the call, the grid, and the RRR. And there's a oh, DT. What's the DT over on the right hand side mean? That is the uh, uh, difference in time uh, between you two. The it's the same thing that's on the water uh, on the, the the table on the left uh, screen. It's the difference in timing. Okay. So you know you're, you're within what a tenth of a second. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Huh. Well, it worked great. That was pretty cool. Well, let's see if we've got some comments from uh, uh, Jim, like to make some observations, W7OUU, because he was involved in this testing. And then uh, uh, perhaps we can go to uh, Q&A. Hey, guys. Well, here's my take on it. I, I think it's it's got some tremendous possibilities uh, for one. And number two, I, I, it's, I don't believe it's going to be a, uh, a mode for the masses, so to speak. Uh, Correct. However, however uh, it, may be, it may become the, the desired mode on, uh, on EME uh, if it does, in fact, uh, replace JT65. I think it has some other possibilities, too, uh, rather than just uh, uh, ionoscatter. 
uh, I think uh, it may be a usable mode for uh, just weak signal in close. And when I say in close, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, 150, 200 miles, uh, rovers, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, uh, some of the guys up in the PNW, I, I know, are, uh, are a little excited about it and uh, maybe trying it uh, this coming summer. Uh, I'm going out on a couple of roads this summer, and uh, for sure, I'll, I'll be experimenting with it. Uh, my favorite mode is 120E. Uh, you know, I've had the most success, actually, with 120E, particularly with low power. Uh, when you're running a kilowatt, uh, it, that, that changes things a lot. But uh, what I, I find exciting about it is that uh, you can use this thing all day long. You don't, uh, you know, I mean, you know, most of us dedicated meteor scatter guys are, uh, you know, we're on every morning. I'm on every morning. And, uh, but this, th this gives me something to do, uh, you know, during the day, except during the season, of course. Uh, I think the jury's out on how it's going to be taken. I think that uh, it's got some great possibilities. Uh, it's it's not for the the guy that's looking for an instant gratification. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to get there. But uh, it's an exciting mode. Uh, I'm excited about it because I can see uh, some possibilities with it. But uh, the only way we're going to find out is let's get on and let's play with it and uh, and see what happens but the testing that hassan and i did i mean I, i'm running an ft 991a i turned it all the way down to nothing i mean it, there's it, it wouldn't go any lower and and hassan was still decoding me like gangbusters so uh yeah it's got some great possibilities and hassan thank you so much you did a fantastic job and i i will continue to work you in the morning <laughs> well i appreciate it uh, anybody that's ever worked for me, I want you. I want you all to know that I always like it when somebody calls again and again and again. I'm interested in propagation. I'm interested in saying hi, um, and so I'm not one of these people who say, "Oh, we've worked before. There's no point in talking to this person." I want to work you every time. I work people every day, and it's a pleasure because I've been a propagation freak since I was a little kid. Since I was 16 and got my license. And I made my first HF contact when I saw the signal bounce across the ionosphere and come, come down in uh, Brazil. And I thought, wow, that feeling's never left me. And oh, now, sorry? Yeah. May I, may I make a, a, a comment? Sure. You know, on Meteor Scatter, you know, if you hear me calling CQ, answer me. I don't care how many times I've worked you. Because oh, yeah. on, meteor, on meteor scatter, I mean, I, I you know, I worked Larry every, every morning in zero I, I, I don't know how many times. It, I, I think I worked him every day so yeah, far. I saw it this morning. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you, you know, meteor, particularly on meteor scatter, I just want to make this comment because I know I've got a bunch of VHFers out there and a lot of you guys in the Midwest. And there's, if you're out at 1200 miles, I can work you. I mean, I've worked a ton of guys out at, at, at a 1100, 1200. 1,250 miles running 100 watts of short Yaggies on two meters. My, my point is this. If you, if you hear me, you decode me, call me. I don't care how many times I've worked you, call me. Uh, I, I will, every meteor scatter contact is different, even though it's with the same station. God bless KS7S down in, in, in Arizona before Jim passed away. I worked him 597 times, <laughs> and, and every contact was different. So, uh, you know, if you hear me on in the morning and I'm pointed east, you know, give me a call. Unless you just, you know, you don't want to talk to me. I don't care. But give me a call. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm the same way. And, and it's all about propagation. Every contact on, on six meters is different. And to watch the, what this has done, what Q65 has done, is given us a real-time uh, capability to watch signal levels vary by uh, the uh, amount of uh, reflections taking place, the, the discontinuities, 
and also also the uh, uh, where we're pointed and everything else. So it's uh, callers are always welcome. I'm still active on MSK144, but I've been very busy with Q65 because I'm trying to learn a new mode and see what what it can do. But uh, let's see if there's questions. Uh, if we hey, hey Hassan, you should talk about the uh, uh, about like rovers using this as well, right? For, oh, for weird things. Absolutely, a very important point. I, I made it earlier, but I might have glossed over it a bit. Is this is a uh, a fill-in mode? It will cover any distance up to the limit of uh, uh, double hops and triple hops. We haven't tested it for that yet, but I I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. But let's just say, okay, 12, 1400 miles, fine. But it covers everything. There's no dead space because for the first 200 miles, the first 300 miles, you can work ground wave or uh, uh, tropo ducting. Uh, for, for the next uh, several hundred miles, you can work tropo scatter. For the next several hundred miles, you can work ionoscatter. scatter. For the, so there is no real limit uh, like with MSK 144, uh, you can work a little ground wave. It's not great that you can work a little, but there's this big vacuum uh, from uh, uh, un about 400 miles down to 200 miles. You're not going to get anything. Well, this can fill in with no effort, whatever. It will be able to do some uh, really amazing things. In fact, uh, I had somebody tell me that, that uh, when it comes down to getting that last tough grid uh, for FMMA or FFMA, that 120E will be a game changer because they'll be able to fill in those last difficult grids uh, with some ease instead of having to uh, uh, go nuts. So a lot of potential here. It isn't for the math, uh, masses, but every mode has a purpose. And this Q65 has some amazing things that, that it can do. It'll those never guys be that are, uh, Those guys that are after FFMA, <laughs> That 200 to 400 mile range is the toughest range. And uh, I, I really do think that this mode will, will, uh, will enhance that uh, immensely. Oh, dramatically. There's no doubt about it. Hey, Jim. Uh, okay, how about Hassan? Yes. Could I? Jim just mentioned something. I'm, I'm relatively new into the six meter. Just got my general again back in December. Um, and of course, they're spending my money really well. Uh, trust me, uh, LF, uh, LFAs, amps, we're going crazy. But the comment I wanted to make was I wanted to get used to this Q65. So I pointed my LFA south and just let it run Q30. Um, and I had a contact out of the blue. I was just, I had no idea anybody was out there. 100 and uh, let's see, 180 miles, 182 miles to medford from dallas oregon uh answered my cq and we had a full qso uh no skips whatsoever um 182 miles so you said the two to 400 range um this will be great and when i do my roving uh in june at charlie november 93 i will be doing some uh definitely uh you know this q65 it looks like it'll be really good Right, and, and something remarkable about that is you have the ability to uh, make choices of mode. So if you get into a situation where Q65 30A on 50.275 won't work, have the people exercise some patience and go to Q65 120 Echo uh, at two minutes. And uh, I'm prepared to guarantee you that it will work without any trouble at all. Uh, when, Jim, when Jim and I first did the testing and we started running our power down and down and down and down and down, after a while, Jim typed to me because we were chatting. Uh, he typed to me and said, this is magic. It's ridiculous. And that's exactly right. But you have to be patient. You got to be willing to go the two minute sequences when things and get One through. further thing I just wanted to mention, I want to thank you and Jim, first of all, because I am new. I'm learning a whole lot from you guys, everybody else here too. Thank you for being here. Um, it's great what you're doing because uh, this is gonna be a game changer for a lot of people. Hey, hey Mark, we're, we're just letting you build your bank account back up. <laughs> <laughs> I got a rotor coming, I gotta get cable, I got, <laughs> it never ends. Austin, where do folks uh, hang out on reflectors? Uh, ping jockey and 
on 4 KST well, or? A actually, uh, if you're looking for uh, discussion and help, there's a whole bunch of us that hang out on, uh, on, there's a bunch of people that hang out on Slack. And then there's a bunch of us that hang on, on a chat tango group called Morning Mayhem. And that's where KB7IJ and myself and K5GZR, WB4HIE, um, there's a whole bunch of us that are both, that are, we're involved in Meteor Scatter, we're involved in Q65, and, and some of us are involved in satellite. So that, that's another area where that's a watering hole that I'm always in. Where is Morning Mayhem? Is, it, is that online I, somewhere? It, it, yeah, it's in, chat, it's, it's in a chat group called Chat Tango. I can, uh, uh, if you send me an email uh, uh, off my QRZ address, uh, I will give you the address to uh, Morning Mayhem because we do a lot of helping right there on the spot because you can, you can type back. Uh, basically, the address is uh, uh, the word, all one word, Morning Mayhem, M-O-R-N-I-N-G-M-A-Y-H-E-M -E dot chat tango, C-H-A-T-A-N-G-O dot com. That is our group. And if you uh, go there, uh, uh, we'll all be there. We're there every morning. It's like... Uh, uh, a coffee clutch. Okay, what so, other question is related to uh, probably moon bounce, but I'm just getting set up to do, I'll call it not quite QRP on uh, 1.25 meters. What's the best chat room to try to get a hold of people for that? Would that be Slack or I'm already in, on Slack? No, I think it's uh, the, the KS, uh, ON, uh, uh, what oh. is KSD? Okay. Son, you yeah. might be interested to know that I listened to, uh, listened in on the test between you and Jim. Another thing is that I used to, when I was back in the late 50s, early 60s, I used to work canine EID across Missouri, and we would correlate signal strengths with the weather, and that was on yeah. AM, some single sideband and CW. Oh, yeah, that's remarkable. Hi, Hassan. Long time no see. Actually, I've never seen you. Oh, hey, Chris. How you doing? <laughs> Chatted with you a lot. Uh, I just thought I'd mention to you guys uh, in the last five minutes, I'm doing uh, um, Q65 15 seconds to middle of Manitoba on UHF. So it, it works all the way up to there. Another thing, Hassan. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. but No, that's it. That's all I had to Go, go for it, Jack. Oh, that is way cool, Chris. <laughs> I worked about four or five XE stations on ES and Q65 the other night. Yeah, XE2OR has been on uh, frequently, and there's uh, the, there's a couple of other guys, too. They're, they're actually a... XE2OR is about the only one that's in range for me um, without band enhancement, but uh, uh, they are showing up, and as far as the, uh, the comment on uh, Q6515A, keep in mind that that is the least sensitive of the modes. So when the band is open, it's gonna be fine. Uh, but if you want optimum performance, uh, that's why you're seeing the default uh, setting for six meters uh, is uh, Q65.30A uh, because it's uh, a three dB more sensitive than 15 but uh, it's not as difficult as uh, 120, which is so much longer. Can, one, Thank you. can 120 be run on sub-mode A, or is that specifically for E? We ran a bunch of tests, and we found that 120 Echo was the best of the 120 A, B, C. In other words, it's, it, we don't know why. And in fact, even Joe doesn't know why. Uh, but we ran a bunch of tests uh, to see where we got the maximum number of decodes at the lowest power. Uh, and uh, KB7IJ and I did this a lot. And what we found is for some reason, 120E works better than 120A, B, or C. So, eh. Hassan? I have a theory yeah. on that. A, B, C, D, and E. What are they? Oh, those are the various widths uh, that involve the, the, the spread of the signal. So uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, 
Uh, it's the amount. It's the amount of spreading I'll tolerate, and uh, 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 the width. So if you change from A to E, the actual bandwidth that you're transmitting changes. So they're called. They're they're in sub mode letters. They're, that's the yes. selection to yes. the right of the receive Correct. frequency. Right. That, that's exactly right. And the uh, uh, all I can tell you is that our experiment showed for six meters. And the propagation that we're exposed to, we found 120E to be uh, the best uh, uh, for us. And that's why I didn't mention the other ones because I didn't want to confuse anybody, but they all have their purpose. I'm surprised uh, there isn't more 120E run off the moon. But like I said, some of the theoretical uh, concerns indicated that 120C should be plenty wide for uh, uh, six meters in our normal use. But it wasn't true because 120E was producing more decodes, decodes. And I can't tell you why, but uh, I'm not running 120C when I know E works better. Bill, you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking one of the issues that happens and the, the problem, it probably goes back to as you go up or longer in time, for some reason, it compresses the bandwidth. So if you go from uh, say 30A to 120A, the bandwidth gets compressed on the signal. And I'm thinking what happens is it gets so close together that if there are any meteors mixed into it, uh, the mechanism to reject the, reject the meteor uh, scatter pings probably uh, becomes less active. So by going to E, it spreads it back out a whole bunch again and uh, all you, you gain the sensitivity of both the longer uh, bit times and the longer uh, or the wider bandwidth so that uh, it can more differentiate between the signals and you don't have the meteors uh, become an issue. And at 120 seconds, uh, that's a long time to not have a meteor scatter ping in there. So uh, <laughs> it's good to have the best immunity you can from it. It also gives you a lot of time to go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> so we should be using E when we're on 120 and uh, A definitely for 15 seconds kind of thing? Yeah, 15A, 30A, and 120E are the primary ones that I would be using, uh, okay. unless you're involved in a lot of experimentation, because uh, W1, uh, VD, and K2DRH have been doing a lot of experimenting on two meters, and they have found that uh, I think it was uh, 60B uh, was what they were using that produced the most decode. So a lot of this is very uh, uh, experimental at this point. Well, maybe I should switch to that right now. I'm trying to get these guys. They're getting me minus 11, minus 12 in Manitoba right now, but so oh, 60B well, so might be a chance. Yeah. Well, the, what, no, what I'm saying is, is that the signals are strong, stay with the shortest uh, transmission yeah. rate. Which well, so, some, some guys are, but some guys with not as good a station. I'm, I'm working V4MA. I think you might know, some of you guys might oh, know yeah. Barry in Manitoba. He's got a good station, but some of the other guys are, are struggling. So maybe I suggest going to 60B here in a minute. That's it. This is really interesting stuff, Hassan. Thank you for doing all the work and Jim and of course, Joe Taylor. Wow. What, that's uh, yeah. You guys are working hard. I'm appreciated. I have a question yeah. about uh, six meter EME, if I can. Uh, this is uh, Sid, K5XI, and maybe a question more appropriate for Lance, but um, I'm wondering the um, current impressions about the extent to which Q65 may replace JT65A for six meter EME, and are people using the 60A flavor of uh, Q65 for six meter EME or 120E? No, he's using, uh, if Lance is here, he can answer. Otherwise, I'll tell you what it was like when I, I tried to work him. Uh, he was running uh, 60A, Q65, a 60A. Uh, and he copied me and I don't have any elevation and I've just got, uh, you know, six, 700, or well, it would have been about 700 watts uh, to my five element LFA at the horizon. And he decoded me twice. That's I did not have a good. Uh, what? That's your driver. That's your driver <laughs> yeah, that you're using, Hassan. 
Don't kid us. We know. Oh, <laughs> well, in any case, I didn't have my good preamp on. And also, I've got some local noise. So I didn't expect to really hear it. And the fact that he decoded me, I, I was astounded. He also decoded KB7IJ uh, doing the same thing. And Rich's noise is so high, he didn't hear him either. Thanks. Sid, most of our testing has been with um, with the 60A, and I know N0TB is on here, and um, he's participated in a bunch of tests, too. Um, we don't really know yet because the next couple days are really the best days of the month for six-meter EME, so it'll be interesting to see what people will end up doing. Frankly, on weak signals, you know, for decades – the standard for EME was two minute sequences on CW. And so it doesn't bother me to run two minutes if, if I have to with a weak signal, uh, with a weak, a weak station. And that's what I'm gonna do tonight in 45 minutes and also uh, tomorrow night then also. So, well, but I think it's gonna mostly be probably uh, 60 seconds. Well, We'll see. It it seems to be compatible, com comparable in terms of uh, sensitivity to JT sixty five. If the stations are running one on one, and so if you set up a sked, I think you're just as well the to use uh, Q sixty five, but. You know, right now there are quite a few little tweaks that you have to do to get things uh, working optimum, and uh, that'll improve too as the releases come come out further. Are you doing the uh, QSO zone fifty one ninety or somewhere else? Well, we did all our testing on fifty point two eleven. Um, I think I'm going to run my contacts on 190 if it's if it's open. Um, but we'll just arrange we'll arrange at the time on the ON4KST six meter chat page. Thanks. Have you tried to run the E sub mode on one, you know 120E uh, off the moon yet, Lance? No, I have not. the 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 most sensitive modes are going to be the narrowest ones, so. The A is definitely the mode to be using for EME. Okay. And any other uh, questions, guys, before I shut her down? Uh, how how to know uh, what letter are you using when I am monitoring the uh, on two seventy five? Okay, Rafa, you should be uh, you should be running uh, Q sixty five thirty alpha sub mode A thirty second sub mode A. But uh, what is what is the difference between A B C D or E? Uh, the, <laughs> that's a very complicated thing. But no one is running anything other than thirty A on fifty point two seven five. Oh, okay. uh, the, the basic difference is that the higher the letter is, the farther apart the tones are spaced. So they're easier for the decoder to identify specific tones in, that, in, in their slots. The negative side is that uh, obviously as you go wider, it takes up more bandwidth. So you have to stay as narrow as you can in a, when you're trying to share a specific frequency with people at the low end or the middle end and whatever. You get to a high letter and you're taking up half of that uh, three kilohertz or more than half of the three kilohertz uh, space that a, a normal radio has. It would also let in more noise. Well, okay. <laughs> The, the point is, the point is, the higher the letter, the more sp space you take up. Yeah, the, the, the thing we have to consider is uh, noise, noise in these digital modes is not the same as 
uh, noise in the typical SNR measurements we do on HF or other things that are taking place because otherwise we would be narrowing up our passband using these uh, digital modes and Joe has specifically said, do not do that, Correct. you'll ruin your decoding. So it's a little, it's a little different in these uh, digital modes that the, uh, uh, the passband needs to be wide for the decoders to operate at the best efficiency. All right, well, that's great guys. And uh, good question, Rafa. And uh, we'll uh, have a recording of this uh, ready for, uh, for tomorrow. And uh, thanks for everybody uh, joining us tonight. And especially thanks to Hassan, Jim, and, and uh, La uh, Lance, and, and all the other questions you guys gave us. Can I ask one more question? OK, slide one more. <laughs> Sorry. Dave, uh, KFAQL in Michigan. Uh, Hassan, we talked about these are all arranged contacts. But then you talked about rovers in contest. I am a rover. How would I, how would I practically use this in a contest? as a rover? Well, uh, first of all, you'd pro for, the, for the roving contacts that are like, I've just got to get this guy worked, I've, you're going to have to arrange that using your, your cell phone and texting and stuff. And then you go to 120E and you'll, you'll probably have success. Uh, but for, hey guys, uh, I'm going out here and you might be looking for me. At, at, that, at that point, uh, you just go to um, uh, Q6530A on 50.275, and people know that they're looking for you, and uh, they'll be spread out calling you, and you will see them. Okay, and how do we avoid interfering with each other? Um, we're not sure what, ki what kind of interference there is going to be. Uh, I see four or five people uh, at a time without difficulty, and some overlap seems to be tolerated, but we won't know for sure until we uh, actually do it. Uh, it's so early uh, that uh, we're all in a state of marveling at what it can do. We haven't figured out the stuff that it doesn't do well yet. <laughs> well, and, and there's, there's a lot of bandwidth on six meters for sure. There's lots of space. So if you wanted to pick a some frequency that's not a normal watering hole frequency and announce that as your frequency like 350 or 330 or something like that uh, that's a reasonable suggestion for somebody that's going to be out roving Hassan. oh absolutely absolutely Hassan, this is jim uh, as a rover uh i always uh well in advance before i go on the rove uh let guys know what grids i'm going to be in and if I have, uh, and what frequencies I'm going to be on uh, using what mode, and if I have uh, internet connectivity, uh, you know, VSL, then uh, that's, a, that's another way to, uh, to let everybody know. <clears throat> there is a Slack page uh, actually for, uh, for rovers. And uh, I would highly recommend, uh, I'll use it uh, if I have internet connectivity, but, uh, <clears throat> where, where we're sitting now with this mode, uh, and as, as, uh, as he pointed out, uh, the band being four megahertz wide, uh, let's be honest, guys, how much of that are we using? Not near enough. So, you know, I don't think finding a frequency on six meters is going to be an issue. So, you know, I mean, if you want to go off to, you know, 50.312 or, you know, 262 or wherever you want to go uh that that's uh that's going to be my plan anyway i think the, the, the uh, a more central question for a lot of rovers is, is going to be once i get a frequency picked and it easily quite could be uh, 275 without difficulty um uh how many signals are we going to see at a time and uh because i they know we're there and uh are there going to be issues? And my answer to that is, I hope we try it so we can find out, because right. I don't know. You know, it's just, people just spread out and use different offsets. You can get 20 stations in there not overlapping at all. Uh, you know, from 200 to 20, 2200 uh, hertz. And, and if they're 50 hertz wide, you can just space out the, all the way across the band and it's not a problem. 
No, no, it's not that that wouldn't be the problem. I think the problem is, is if you have, uh, let's say you have a little enhancement and people are all of a sudden seeing uh, 20 signals that weren't there before. Uh, we don't know how Q6530A is going to perform when we have a lot of overlapping signals, not on purpose, but just because the band came up. We don't know what's going to happen yet. We, we have not watched it occur. I've seen some single overlapping with just fine, but multiple stations, uh, it's not its not going to be as good as FT8, that's for sure. Well, maybe Hassan, you can give us an update maybe in a, in a month or two and uh, we can do another one of these sessions and you can kind of give us an update as to what you've learned and what's changed. Well, yes, and especially if, uh, as we get uh, RC2, Release Candidate 2 and some of the other ones uh, coming out. This is, this is just kind of an introduction. Let's get started and, and uh, uh, it's kind of a, uh, uh, an advertisement for a new mode that seems to be working quite well. Uh, all based on experience, not based on theory. I don't understand the theory. It's way over my head. <laughs> yeah, some of all of us. Question? Oh, another question. Quick yeah, WB, WB9 TMH. What about 432 megahertz? Oh, Any... it would work if you could find somebody to work there, sure. And a distance on that? I'm doing it right now. I got about 200 miles. There isn't as much ionoscatter scatter on available on 70 centimeters as there is on six meters and two meters. So it does decrease, but you still have tropo scatter, tropo ducting uh, 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 available. And right. uh, I don't know what, I think there can be some uh, e-skip on, on 432, but it's not great. But for sure, you could still run. Tropo scatter is, is uh, good out to about 400 miles, I believe. Uh, <coughs> I think that's correct. Uh, so you could run tropo scatter uh, with enough if you have enough juice to run it uh, on 432 without any trouble at all. I ran uh, tropo scatter on uh, three gigahertz when I was in the army uh, over a 175 mile path, but we were also running uh, 1800 watts output on three gigahertz. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I think this has been uh, an amazing session. I want to thank Hassan and Jim and, and everyone else who's, who's joined in. Uh, we've gone for almost two hours, which is, I think, a new record for us. <laughs> so uh, a lot of fun with, with new modes here. And uh, as Paul has suggested, Hassan, we'd love to hear back in a month or two, maybe after there's an RC2, some more experimenting, and, and also from any of you folks, what... Uh, you know what you've learned or what you're doing uh feel free to uh message all of us from the front range six meter groups io if if uh if you can and otherwise uh i think we'll look forward to having uh, a lot more fun with this going forward thanks bill yep yeah. it's been right. fun guys thanks a lot See good you night yeah. Bye for now. thank you thank you great, thanks, Paul, great presentation great. thank you Hassan, thank you. jim and lance yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good job, guys. Catch you on the rocks in the morning.